Hello, this is Rabbi Juan Marcos with Juana Gutierrez. I'm driving home, and I just released a new title today, uh, titled Jewish Conquistadors in the World, the Early Years, because I envision it as a part of a series. Um, I had posted it online in different Facebook groups that I'm a part of, and I got an unexpected response, uh, which is actually the reason that I'm recording this video. Um, the individual that responded uh, was very upset at the title. Uh, the first issue that they raised or that they contended was that um, there were no Jews in the New World. Um, the forced converts were not Jews because they had converted to Christianity. Um, and in addition to that, even if they were, they had committed uh, many violations of Jewish law and, and therefore they weren't Jewish. Um, and it was uh, unexpected, but I wanted to respond to that. And in fact, I did respond to it, but it, uh, it got a little heated, um, which was, was somewhat surprising. The first thing that I noted was that the simple fact that they did not uh, observe Jewish law wholly or fully, or even had violated it, did not constitute an, uh, an abridgment or a cancellation of their Jewish status. Chalacha uh, does not work that way. Um, they might have been bad Jews, if you will. They may have had Jews who were uh, violating the Torah precepts, but if we were to use that basis of definition for Jewish identity today, I think most people listening to this video would know that the majority of Jews would probably fall considerably short of, uh, of Jewish identity. Now, the other thing that I responded was that many of the, uh, one of the counter arguments that was raised by this individual was that, you know, they, these individuals who fled to the New World did not try to join Jewish communities in other parts of uh, the world. Instead, they ventured to the New World. And I, and I mentioned that it's not as simple as that. Uh, one of the issues that people have to remind themselves about, or, or at least learn about, is that in the cases of individuals who fled the peninsula, let's say 1492, you decided that you were going to leave, you weren't going to submit to conversion. Many of those individuals traveled, for example, to Sicily or to other parts where they encountered what? They encountered decrees that gave them a choice between forced conversion and exile. So they had just left the peninsula and then they travel and they encountered the same situation. Some people did not have the financial resources to be able to venture out again and choose uh, another option. Now, one of the things I did today is on a different, sort of a different topic, uh, but very much related to this, is that I, I recorded a video uh, on a responsum of the Ribash uh, regarding Anusim and the validity of the divorce document of, of a particular woman who herself was a forced convert, and the issue had to do with the people who had been witnesses to the get were also converts. And a community uh, to which she fled in North Africa was asking about the legitimacy of the document. And the Ribash begins to explain different points about this particular issue. And he mentions that there were different types of Anusim. Some Anusim had essentially become turncoats, you know, trying to persecute their fellow Jews, you know, to, to gain uh, approval of governmental authorities. But there were other Anusim whose hearts were directed toward heaven and for various reasons had not been able to leave the peninsula. And one of the reasons that was given was maybe they didn't have the financial resources to be able to go. Uh, or maybe they didn't have the financial resources to go with their families. Uh, that is to say that they may have been able to go as, as an individual, but they will not have necessarily had the ability to take their families, their children, you know, their extended family with them. And so the Ribash said that in this particular case, the ideal was that they should essentially abandon their family. Uh, you know, the love of Hashem, uh, but Hashem uh, surpassed, you know, the, the issue of family. But uh, the reality is that very few people can contend with that type of a standard. Um, it's interesting, and I've, I've always noted this, that the Ribash, Rabbi Isaac uh, Bar Sheshet Perfe himself, uh, was a rabbi in Valencia. Uh, and he was a forced convert himself. He converted and he lived out of... Uh, of life uh, for about a year and a half and, and then eventually fled. Uh, I don't know all the details. I don't think anyone knows the details of his escape and so forth. But the point is that not everybody had the same uh, resources available. And the fact that you have individuals that journeyed westward into the new world and that many of them continue to practice uh, Jewish observances in some form or fashion, uh, I think makes it clear that at least in their minds, 
they were adhering to Judaism to the best of their ability. Now, there's another thing that I think I should know. At the Spurtis Institute of Jewish Studies in Chicago, where I, where I studied my uh, doctorate, Rabbi Byron Sherwood, of blessed memory, um, taught a class titled, Who is a Jew? And he started the class by asking, um, or presenting a particular scenario about an individual uh, who was in prison, in the American prison system. And he was claiming to be a Jew. He wanted to have kosher meat or something of that nature, kosher meals. And there was a whole court case about it because the individual wasn't halakhically Jewish. Um, and it was the question of whether an individual had the ability to claim Jewish identity uh, without a formal conversion. And the whole point of the discussion was, as Rabbi Sherwin explained, was to understand that when we say uh, a person is Jewish, we need to understand in what context we are making the statement. Are we talking about, you know, historical context? Are we talking about uh, the context of halakha? And if so, in what particular context? Are we talking about in the mind of conservative Judaism? Are we talking about in the mind of Orthodox Judaism? And in case we are referring to Orthodox Judaism, what particular stream? Because in the case of Anasim, what we find is different rabbis and different responses on how Anasim and their descendants, the B'nai Anasim, should be treated. Some individuals said, we don't suspect that they come from mixed marriages. We believe that they are, you know, their mother is Jewish. We assume that. Uh, and we welcome, in the, welcome them in uh, by taking care of the issues that need to be taken care of. The example of Britney Law, they're not circumcised if they come, you know, they need to get married, you know, they have a Jewish wedding, we rectify that. In other cases, there were rabbis like uh, Rabbi uh, Ibn Zimra, uh, the Radbaz, who said if we, if we have a question regarding the Jewish ancestry of the mother, then, you know, we, we basically do a giyur lechumra. Uh, just in case, uh, but it was apparent that there were various authorities who had different standards, and they say, listen, if we don't have a reason to question, uh, we don't need to question this. And the very fact that we can find communities in Amsterdam and other places that were receiving individuals 100, 150 years, even longer than that after the expulsion, and certainly you know, 250 years after the initial uh, violence of 1391, uh, and they were basically looking to them to return, uh, tells us that from their perspective, there was Jewish identity there. The other issue that we have to take into consideration is that from the perspective of the Inquisition, these individuals were Judaizers. Um, they were lapsed heretics. They were heretics because they were legally Christian, but the fact that they had adopted or continued in the observances of the Law of Moses or the Torah uh, made them uh, heretics or Jews, quite frankly quite openly. And so I think that this this idea that somehow if you have you have a forced convert that they automatically lose their status of Jewishness is, is based off of a particular bias that is coming from several, you know, other issues that are unrelated. Um, and it's not necessarily, it's not historically true, it's not philologically true. If you want to, you know, talk about individuals who are voluntary converts, okay, that's, we can, we can have an open discussion regarding that. But I think that the antagonism that was uh, levied against the book, without even having read it, uh, without even having perused it, it, it's somewhat you know, disappointing. And I think that this is sort of the reaction that we have uh, for many individuals for various reasons. Some of them are from Ashkenazic backgrounds, some of them are from Sephardic backgrounds. I think a lot of it has to do with ignorance, quite frankly. A lot of it has to do with some kind of a personal bias against individuals that uh, did not grow up in a, in a Jewish uh, context through no fault of their own. Um, and I think that it, it, it highlights some of the challenges and problems that we face when we talk about banana seam. You have individuals, as I've noted in previous videos, who are looking to reconnect uh, with what they believe are their Jewish backgrounds. It is not a, 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 a popularity contest. They're not gaining brownie points by doing this. And by acting in a manner that is very, um, I think, arrogant, uh, and uh, offensive, it, 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 it's just sort of disappointing. Now, another contention that was raised by this individual had to do with the um, what, what are labeled as atrocities that were committed by the, the conquistadors in the New World. You know, the perspective of a historian is to lay out the facts. It is not to justify, it is not to condemn, it is not to present biased ideas about uh, 
what is ethical and what is unethical in war. Now that may be disturbing to many people, but that is the mark of a true historian, at least as far as I'm concerned. I'm not condoning the behavior of the uh, conquistadors, but neither am I condoning the behavior of many of the native tribes that joined the conquistadors in their uh, conquest or their battle against the Aztec Empire. I'm not interested in the moral question. That is a philosophical, religious question, theological. I'm interested in that particular book, The Jewish Conquistadors, about the historical uh, experience of individuals who were conversos or in some cases may have even not been even baptized uh, because sometimes it's difficult to know whether these were first generation individuals who sort of, you know, managed to escape detection um, in, in their journey in the new world. And I'm certainly not the first individual who has talked about this. There have been many books that have been written by other scholars, uh, Seymour Liebman, you know, uh, the Jews in East Spain, Jews in the New World, the Inquisitors and the Jews in the New World, other works that have been written. Um, and I, so I think that the idea of, of Jewishness needs to be understood historically. It does need to be understood from a halachic perspective, but even then there is a, uh, uh, there are various views in question. Um, and I think that an individual at the very least has to look at the material. And if that's something that they don't want to accept, nobody obligates them to do that. Uh, but I think it's important to look at the evidence um, and if you want to look at things and say, you know, it's disappointing to see that Jews were involved in conquest, that's perfectly fine. I had a discussion with someone this weekend, and they asked me if Jews were involved in the slave trade. And I said, it's, you know, in my studies, I haven't met a person directly involved, but I don't have a question about them being involved because I knew that in, in Amsterdam, for example, there were individuals that were involved in the sugar trade. And in, in fact, we know from cases, I, I sort of retract that, I don't know of a particular name of a person, but there were clear cases of individuals in the Caribbean who were former conversos, they returned to Judaism, and they were involved in the slave trade. And so the purpose of the historian is not to cover up what is uncomfortable, it's to lay out history and to appreciate it for what it is. And so I think it's important to understand that Jews were involved in many facets of history that we may, may, or, may or not like. Uh, but anyways, that's a little, little bit of a rant, I guess you could say, but I think it's, it's important not to approach these issues with, with a bias because of personal, um, almost a vendettas, I guess you could say, or some kind of uh, interaction, because I know this person has had some negative interactions with people who claim to be descendants of Anosim, but to be quite frank, uh, that doesn't really justify the, the response. We have to look at the evidence as it stands, and if you don't agree with it, that's perfectly fine.